Hello and welcome to First Look, a Bible study looking ahead to the reading or readings for the coming Sunday. My name is Carl and it's really good to have you with us. This week we're looking at a challenging block of Jesus' teaching which is about faith and servanthood. Before we dive into it, however, if you've not done so already, you may find it useful to download the sheet accompanying this study, and you'll find the link for that in the video description in YouTube. On the sheet, you will find the text of today's reading, some other passages you may wish to look up, the questions we'll be considering together later on, and lots of room for you to record your own thoughts and observations. And so without further ado, let's dive into today's passage, which comes from Luke's Gospel, chapter 17, verses 5 to 10. We're continuing our exploration of Jesus's travel narrative that saw him set his face to go to Jerusalem in chapter 9, verse 51, and gradually make his way there until we reach the story of Palm Sunday, beginning with chapter 19, verse 27. While he was on the road, Jesus did a lot of teaching to his disciples and to the crowds, and indeed to some people who opposed him along the way. he just, at the beginning of chapter 17, given a stern warning to his disciples about causing little ones to stumble. That's chapter 17, verses 1 and 2. And in 3 and 4, he gave his disciples a very demanding commandment about forgiveness, about forgiving those who have sinned if they repent and doing so again and again, and about rebuking their fellow disciples if they should sin. It's that little snippet, verses 1 to 4 of chapter 17, that set the background for this text. So in the passage, we have Jesus preaching as he goes with a real urgency to those diverse groups of people following him. And we also have the disciples, including but not limited to the twelve. And they're depicted here as behaving as a unit in requesting more faith. Now Luke's Gospel was the third of the four canonical Gospels to be written around 80 to 85 of the Common Era. And one of the features of Luke is that he sometimes draws on Matthew and Mark, the earlier synoptic Gospels, in formulating his text. And we see that here in this group of sayings. So Luke draws on the imagery we find, for example, in Mark chapter 11, verses 20 to 25, where Jesus talks about a fig tree and the moving of the Temple Mountain by faith it being thrown into the sea, as it were. And that imagery is referenced in verse 6 of today's passage. <clears throat> Luke also draws on Matthew, Matthew 17, verse 20, a saying from their common source, from the Q source, which concerns mustard seeds being the smallest of the seeds. In Matthew's case, talking about a great tree growing up from that. And again, that is referenced in verse 6. And we might also wish to look at Luke chapter 9, verses 57 to 62, and chapter 14, verses 25 to 34, which contain verses about the urgency and costs of discipleship, respectively. Now, this reading consists of two parts. We have the disciples asking for their faith to be increased and Jesus' immediate response to that in verses 5 and 6 followed by some teaching about the expectations on the disciples in verses 7 to 10. Now, given the very daunting talk of forgiveness and, and, and the expectations Jesus had of his disciples, the very high bar that he set for them, it's perhaps no wonder that they asked for greater faith in verse 5. And the Greek word, Pistis, which is translated as faith, could also be translated as trust or confidence. So that's what we're talking about here. We're not talking about 
then wanting to increase belief in Jesus in the way that Saul might talk about believing in UFOs or the Loch Ness Monster, for example. We're talking about them asking to increase their level of faith, trust, confidence in him. Now, it's interesting that talking about faith in unexpected ways and in unexpected people is a major theme in Luke's gospel. And we find that is the case in various healing narratives and also in Luke's version of Jesus's being anointed by a woman with oil using her hair. So we might look, for example, at chapter 3, verse 48, at chapter 7, verses 9 and 50, and then later on in chapter 17, verse 19, and chapter 18, verse 42. These give us a range of examples of people who we might think would lack faith, but actually are exemplars of what it means to have true faith in Jesus. We might contrast that with Luke's version of the story of the uh, storm and Jesus' stilling of it in his declaration of the disciples as having a lack of faith in chapter 8, verse 25. So this issue of faith is a major one in Luke's Gospel. Now mustard seeds were among the smallest of the seeds that were used at that time. And as I've already hinted at earlier, from that tiny seed could grow a massive shrubbery. And in Matthew's use of that, we hear about the birds coming to make their nest in this tree as it symbolises the kingdom. So it's a good symbol for that. But here it's used to speak of faith. Now, in verse six, where Jesus talks about the disciples needing to have faith the size of a mustard seed, the Greek syntax implies that they lack even this minimal amount of faith. But it's also arguable in this very mixed verse that trying to quantify the amount of faith one has is, is not the point. It seems to me when Jesus draws on this imagery from Mark and Matthew to talk about um, faith that could take a tree and, and stick it in the water, as it were, Jesus is saying that even a little faith is sufficient to accomplish even the most demanding tasks of discipleship. And so perhaps we could say from this verse that the request of the disciples for their faith to be increased is perhaps somewhat misguided. Maybe it's more Jesus getting them to focus on the faith they do have. So that's the first part of today's reading. The second part in verses 7 to 10, undoubtedly in its talk of slavery, contains imagery that's really difficult for us to grapple with as modern readers in the aftermath of the horrors of the transatlantic slave trade. But we need to bear in mind that that's not necessarily the lens through which Luke was looking at this. And when it has, in Luke's Gospel, images of, of slaves, in the Greek, doulos, it is talking about not just a sort of socio-economic reality, but about people who were completely devoted to another. And this imagery could indeed be used in a positive way. So, for example, in chapter 2, verse 29, Simeon describes himself as the slave of God, the servant of God, in the Jerusalem temple when he encounters Mary and Jesus at only a few days old. Note also that Jesus calls on his followers to be watchful slaves in chapter 12, verse 35 to 48, and turns ideas upside down in that passage by talking about he himself serving um, the disciples, his would-be followers. Jesus also talks in chapter 19, verses 11 to 27, about being prudent slaves who make the most of the gifts that we've been given. He also, perhaps most unexpectedly of all, in chapter 22, verses 24 to 30, talks about that profound kingdom reversal where he talks about the first being last and the last being first and having come among his disciples as one who serves. Therefore challenging this um, desire to each make themselves the greatest. 
So the relationship between masters and slaves that we find running throughout Luke's gospel is, is complicated. It's not as neat and clear cut as we might first think or perhaps fear. Now, when the parable begins in verse 7, it seems to be inviting its listeners, first of all, to identify themselves with the slave owner. And the slave owner here is depicted as being well off enough to be able to afford a slave, a servant, but not well off enough to be able to afford to have lots of different people that they could assign different tasks to. And it means that this unfortunate slave is required not just to work in the fields, but also to work in their master's home. There are rhetorical questions running throughout the latter part of verse 7 through to verse 9. And these reflect the expectations that were put on slaves at the time. So, as we see in the end of verse 7, the slaves were not expected to have been waited upon by their master, or any other servants for that matter. They would have expected to put the master's needs ahead of their own, as we see in verse 8. And finally, in verse 9, they would not have expected to be thanked for their service. All of those things, I say, are very challenging to us as modern readers, but they reflected what was accepted at the time. In verse 10, the focus seems to shift away from inviting the disciples to identify themselves with the master and instead to identify themselves with a diligent servant. Some argue that this suggests the focus for would-be church leaders, which indeed these disciples, the apostles in particular, were, should be on serving others. It's helpful to note, as we read this, that the Greek word that's sometimes translated as worthless slaves could equally well be translated as unworthy slaves. And I think in the context of thinking about God's grace, that translation as unworthy rather than worthless makes a lot more sense because it invites us to recognise that our service to Jesus and to our fellow human beings and indeed to, to all God's world arguably is not about us kind of bigging ourselves up and making ourselves look good in, in exchange for some kind of reward. Rather it's the natural response to the goodness of God and to the love of God that we ourselves have received. It's our natural response in following Jesus in being someone who has not come to be served but indeed to serve. So taking this passage overall, some argue we could read it as a rebuke of the disciples in verse 6 for their lack of faith and perhaps for expecting some kind of reward or praise or exaltation for their service in verse 10. But I personally don't think that that's the best way to read this text. I think it begs a far more interesting question. What do we mean when we, as disciples, might pray to God for an increase in our faith? Are we looking for some kind of spectacular religious experience? Are we looking for an antidote to the struggles of our daily life? Are we perhaps looking for certainty in the midst of doubts and questions? Or are we looking for something else? In this light, I think we could read the whole of this section, chapter 17, verses 5 to 10, as perhaps a reminder that a mustard seed side's faith leading to a modest discipleship is sometimes exactly what is called for. In other words, sticking to those ordinary practices on a daily basis of fidelity and service may be far more what's required of us as disciples than spectacular deeds like moving trees into water through the power of prayer or whatever. So this is a really interesting complex text that might, as I say at first, make us feel somewhat uneasy. But I think there are potentially some valuable lessons here if we can cope with sitting with the tensions that the imagery might provoke within us about discipleship, about what it means to have faith, 
and about what it means to serve God and serve our, our neighbour. I invite you to grapple further with these questions now as we move into our set questions for this week. Thank you.